Welcome, everyone. So tonight we are very pleased to have with us Victor Anderson, who was visiting professor at the Global Sustainability Institute at Anglia Ruskin University. His research interests include the relationship between ecology and the economy, green politics and economics. Uh, prior to taking up his current position, he worked as a senior policy officer at the World Wildlife Fund, as lecturer at Goldsmiths College, an economist at the Sustainable Development Commission. Uh, he was a board member at the London Development Agency and an elected assembly member at the Greater London Authority. Uh, he has worked in Parliament for eight years and is currently researcher for Lloyd Russell Moyle, uh, and he is our very own parliamentary insider. So welcome, Victor. Uh, we will divide the time in two. Victor will start by talking on the complexities of the legislative process and then answer any questions on that topic before moving on to talk about other opportunities other opportunities for MPs to influence policy, and then more questions. So Victor, I will give you the floor and I will make you uh, fill the screen. Over to you. So um, I, I want to focus particularly on the things that MPs vote about, because if we're watching how MPs vote, um, we need to know, you know, the, what the implications are of different votes on different things. So I think the most important way in which MPs vote is when they vote on laws. And so um, uh, I'm going to go through the stages that a bill goes through to become law, because uh, I think that's that's the most important thing that we need to to uh, look at. Um, so if a bill is regarded as confidential, uh, sorry, not confidential, um, controversial, it starts off in the Commons and goes to the Lords afterwards. Um, so just uh, looking at that um, sequence, there's a first reading, but a first reading doesn't really amount to anything other than the bill being announced. So normally there's no vote on the first reading, the bill just, just gets announced and then um, and then is sort of in in front of the of the House of Commons, but then the the uh, the next stage is the second reading, and the second reading is the main debate on the main principles of the bill, and so the vote at the end of the second reading debate is a, is a key vote. Uh, all MPs can 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 vote in in that um, that vote. Um, so it's a very good way to see, um, you know, how, uh, where people stand on, on different things. So that's the second reading. The bill then goes into the committee stage, and normally the committee stage is dealt with by a small committee, which reflects the composition of the House as a whole. So the government has a majority, um, and there will usually be one uh, SNP or Liberal MP, uh, and the rest will be Labour. So. Um, so you can't really tell what most MPs are doing through committee stage because most MPs are not, are not on, on the committee. It's only a small, you know, like 20 MPs, 15 um, or whatever. Um, some bills have the committee stage on the floor of the House, which means all MPs can, can speak and vote. But that's reserved generally for the most important bills uh, or um, particularly bills that have a constitutional um, constitutional implications. Um, so generally, the committee is just a small committee, but then at, at, at which amendments get get put. So it's an opportunity for everyone to get into the detail of of the bill. Um, and amendments are just designed to change the wording of the of the bill. Um, most amendments are amendments to what's already in the bill. But you can also propose a, a new clause. So the bill consists of you know, a lot of clauses, but you can add clauses or, or you, can, you can delete a whole clause. Um, uh, and um, um, yeah, and, and then people look for the most kind of elegant way to have their amendment. Like, like it, is there a way in which you can get what you want without 
loads of words? Can you have like a simple, you know, nice way of doing it? So people often try and uh, try and get that. So then after it's been in committee, a new version of the bill is printed um, and that then goes to report stage. So report stage is the committee reporting to the whole house and is an opportunity for all MPs um, to debate and vote. So a report stage that all the votes are on amendments, which can include new clauses. Um, so that's also an opportunity where, where we can see you know, where everyone stands, report stage. And then when the bill has been amended at report stage, or you know, might, not, maybe all, all the amendments will be defeated, but when it's gone through report stage, that it goes to third reading. And third reading is the debate on the bill as amended. So the idea is it's different from the second reading debate because the second reading is about the principles of the bill. The third reading is, do you actually like you know, the bill as it stands now after, after it's been amended? And um, so that's also an opportunity for all MPs to speak and vote. And again, is an opportunity for us to see where people stand. So in that process, really for us, the second reading vote is, is important, report stage is important for amendments, and then the third reading vote is important for the bill as a whole. So that completes the process of going through the House of Commons. It then goes through the Lords, and the Lords basically go through the same stages, uh, and um, they will also uh, amend the bill normally. And, and um, you know, we had a case uh, just this week where the Lords amended, um, well, pr pr yeah, pr pr produced 18 amendments to the bill about, my, about immigration, which the government didn't like. Um, so the amendments that the Lords make then go back to the Commons. And that's a process known as ping pong. So if the Lords um, change the bill, the bill you know, in its new version then goes to the Commons and very often the Commons votes to, to throw out the amendments made in, in the Lords. So that's another opportunity for us to see where people stand uh, uh, as to whether they accept the amendments from, from the Lords. Uh, um, and, and at that stage, it's only Lord's Amendments get, that get debated, that, that like everything else is kind of off the table. Um, and so very often what happens is the Lord's Amend a bill, the government don't like the Lord's Amendment, and the, the um, government then try and get their MPs to throw out the Lord's Amendment, and then it goes back to the Lord's, and the Lord's have to decide whether to insist on as they say, on their amendment or whether to back down. And they can insist and then it goes back to the Commons and then maybe they back down the next time, whatever. Generally speaking, the Commons get their way and the Lords back down because the Commons is democratically uh, elected and the Lords obviously isn't. Um, so the Lords generally don't push it to a you know, big confrontation. They usually back down. Sometimes the Lords persuade the government um, to change a bill, and sometimes they get uh, compromise wording agreed. And the Lords always feel in a stronger position if there's a big public fuss about something, because although they're not democratically elected, if they, if they can feel that they speak for the public, um, then they're more inclined to stand firm on amendments. Um, and uh, once that's happened, um, uh, we have a final version of, of, of the bill, which then goes to royal assent, um, where the king is supposed to signify his um, acceptance of what parliament has, has, has decided. And at that stage, it becomes law. Um, it, it's important to note that it doesn't necessarily get implemented instantly. So usually a bill provides for what's called commencement dates. So particular clauses in the bill come into force at different times. It, it, it isn't a kind of instant. I mean, it is sometimes instant, but other times it may be they give themselves six months before 
uh, things actually go into um, effect. Um, so that's taking the example of it starting in the Commons and going to the Lords. Some bills do basically the same thing, but they start in the Lords and go onto the Commons. Um, uh, um, there's a few things to note about um, people voting or not voting. One is um, that MPs, of course, are, are whipped by the party whips of their party. And so it's a much bigger deal if you vote against the whip than um, if you vote with it. So, um, you know, generally MPs will, will take, you know, have an easy life and go by what the whip says. Um, and so if they put themselves out to vote against how they're being whipped, then that, that you know, counts for more in a way, or you know, it's more significant. Um, the other thing that's more significant than that is collective responsibility. So if you're a member of the government um, and you vote against the government, then you probably have to have to leave the government. So again, that's a bigger deal than just an ordinary vote. Uh, and I think the other thing to note about this is that MPs can be absent for perfectly sort of good reasons. So the fact that somebody hasn't voted on something doesn't mean that they're not bothered about it or they deliberately avoided it. It may mean that they've been paired, which is where the whips have an arrangement between the two sides, that if somebody has something else, some reason for not turning up, they try and get somebody on the other side to not turn up so as it doesn't change the, uh, the overall result. Um, and of course, you know, people in the government are very often uh, busy you know, on foreign trips or whatever, and you know, not in a position to, to vote. Uh, so that's the, that's it really. Everyone's, uh, everyone's back. Um, I, have, I have a question to kickstart us um at the committee stage who 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 chooses the uh, the members of that the whips that, so that's what's known as the usual channels <laughs> <laughs> uh and okay so 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 labor will choose the the labor whip the, everyone puts up their best person for the fight then basically um well i mean there'll always be a minister who's in charge of getting the bill through and right. kind of leads the civil service team on the bill and then labor will put up their corresponding put the person from the shadow cabinet or the shadow ministers um and then the other places will be filled you know, by whoever they pick but what that can mean is that rebel people who are not following their party lines can be, you know, excluded or underrepresented at committee stage. Because they're generally people that the whips don't, don't like. My, my next question is, could the ping ponging go on forever? <laughs> uh, it, 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 it never does. Um, it usually, you know, will only be like three times each side at the most but theoretically um, it could theoretic no theoretic well if it came to that then the commons could override the lords but not straight away after a time lag they, they can just override them what is the uh what is the um the fate was it called the fatal motion yes that's about statutory instruments should i i can yes, do, I talk about yeah yeah do. So, so basically, statutory in, uh, statutory instruments are um, also a form of making laws, but uh, the less important than the main bills. But the bills will give ministers powers. Um, so, for example, the bill might say, you know, the BBC will be funded by a license. And then there'll be a statutory instrument to say what the amount will be that the license fee costs. So statutory instruments uh, fill the details in. Sometimes the government governments kind of abuse that by giving themselves loads of scope and being able to produce, you know, loads of statutory instruments to implement the detail, you know, to 
fill in the details of a bill and there's particular concern at the moment about the retained EU law bill that the government's given themselves loads of power. Um, so the problem with statutory instruments is that one thing is there's a lot of them and the other thing is they're not scrutinized very well um, and so um, uh, 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 yeah, and and not just that they're not amendable, so they don't go through a sort of what what one might think of as a proper process. Um, you can either accept them or 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 reject them. Um, and r recently, there was a motion in the House of Lords to reject a statutory instrument, um, but the House of Lords doesn't normally do that because that would mean it was overriding what the Commons did. But the result of that was that there was a proper debate in the Commons on, on that amendment, which normally it would have just gone through with, with no, no debate. Um, but the government kind of felt under pressure and they gave an hour and a half for a you know, proper debate. On, on. It, it, it seems like our, our lack of constitution makes everything seem quite leaky. Yes, I mean, an awful lot depends on conventions and on um, sort of goodwill between everyone, which is not always <laughs> Yes, well, which we're running out of quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we move on, uh, it, has anyone else got anything to uh, comment on or question on this half of the of the talk? Okay, I will give you full screen again, and um, okay. you're going to uh, talk about um, other ways of influencing policy. Yeah, so another thing is 10-minute um, rule bills. So these are bills which, in theory, can go through all the stages and become law, but the vast majority of them just have 10 minutes, literally. So these are bills which enable an MP to raise an issue uh, and speak about it and it just sort of publicizes it and that that's it so sometimes they may get their 10 minute rule bills or taken up as a as a as a few clauses in the government bill you know eventually but that, that's um but it's just a sort of very quick procedure Another thing where you can sort of collect names and see who is voting for what is early day motions. So these are motions um, which express a view. Um, they don't they don't change the law, but they express a view. You know, this this house thinks such and such, um, and then MPs can sign up to those. Um, the they're called early day motions because in theory they can be debated at an early day but it's not a specified day so in fact the day never comes but recently uh, um, things have been changed so that some edms do get debated but this is a, a new innovation uh, it's very shocking um so I mean, EDMs are quite useful in seeing where people stand, and in particular, who's keen on something, because um, there's always the, uh, they're proposed by six MPs, and you can see from who is in the, who's in that initial six, who is particularly interested in an issue. Um, then, of course, there are parliamentary questions, so uh, MPs can table qu questions, it's very easy. For them to do that um there are some rules about questions like they they have to be a single sentence this is written questions have to be a single sentence and have to be about the area of responsibility of a minister so you can't ask the minister you know what do you think of um uh, you know what joe biden's done but you can say what representations have you made to Joe Biden about what he's done, because that is in their area of responsibility. So they're quite, they're pretty strict about um, the questions being done properly. Um, some questions are oral questions. So members of the cabinet have a question time, I suppose about every month um, where there's, there's an hour or half an hour, you know, where, they, where they're questioned. 
Um, then um, another important part of the thing is select committees. So uh, there's a select committee for each government department, and that's screwed. And, uh, and, and there's a few more co co committees too, but it's basically one per department, and that scrutinizes what the um, what the government's doing in that in that department. So. Um, so recently, uh, there was the establishment of the Energy Security and Net Zero Department, and therefore there's now an Energy Security and Net Zero Select Committee, um, which has just started and is, I think, going to give the national grid a, a, a hard time um, in the autumn, um, because there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the national grid and its failure to properly take on board renewable energy. Um, because it you know designed a lot before that. Um, so select committees um, can be influential when they produce their reports, the government uh, have to reply to the report, which can often be you know we turn down the recommendations of the committee, but at least they have to consider them and they have to give a proper reply. Um, then another thing is um, the uh, debates that are not about making law but enable um, MPs to express a view. So there are opposition day debates where uh, normally the main opposition party, but it can be other opposition parties, choose the topic for the debate for that day, or they may split it, have two debates, um, and that's and they will put a, a, a motion to the house but that can't change the law that's just an expression of opinion and then there are also opportunities which are particularly for backbenchers to raise issues um adjournment debates at the end of the day and westminster hall debates where they can have a debate on in the in the kind of side chamber of westminster hall which is the oldest part of the building um and then just Final thing to mention is the all party parliamentary groups, the APPGs. So the there are there are loads of these, and these are groups set up by members interested in, in a particular topic. In the press, they're often confused, and I think they often deliberately try and confuse the media with select committees. So select committees are important. They're part of the structure of parliament. APPGs are just informal groups. So recommendations from an APPG don't count for anything like a recommendation from a select committee. Um, and also APPGs can be a way in which outside organizations kind of infiltrate parliament by providing the secretariat for the group so for example companies or ngos can set can set up an appg install themselves as the secretariat organize the meetings and you know have, have things going on in, in in parliament that way thank you uh quite a lot to uh get our teeth into there. Uh, Jessica. Um, the how sometimes when I um, I was having something to do with Rosie Boycott at some point, um, and she asked if we wanted her to put uh, a question um, to the House of Lords. Um, and as you say, you know, um, MPs can do it as well. Can you think of some things where that might be useful for MP Watch to do? That? Um, well, I mean, you can ask questions specifically about climate policies. Um, I think that's often useful. Um, so, I mean, for example, uh, I've just got the MP that I work for to put in a question about the Energy Charter Treaty, um, you know, where the government has signed up to to a, a, to compensate um, companies that lose out as a result of changes in in um, energy policy, uh, which is ludicrous. Uh, a lot of countries are leaving this treaty. You know, France and Germany and other places are leaving it, but the UK is still in it. So, you know, that's a case where you, at least you can ask the question. 
will government leave it? Yes, very worrying. Uh, Lisa. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, like quite often you see when there's a debate or a vote, there's hardly anyone there. What determines, oh. what determines <laughs> how many people get to vote, if anything? That, is it just mm. luck, on, luck on who's there on the day? Well, there's always a lot going on at the same time. So as well as the debate in the chamber, there might be a debate in Westminster Hall, there might be select committee, there might be an APPG, you know, there might be meeting constituents or other people or hosting things or in their constituencies. So there's always a lot going on. But very often what happens is that MPs are in the building and then they will just turn up for the vote at, at the end. So, um, you know, they might go into the beginning of debate to hear the big name speakers, then disappear and do other things uh, and then come back right at, 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 at the end to vote. Um, so a lot depends, you know, what else is going on that day. Um, and that's quite unpredictable because obviously Parliament's affected by what's in the news. And if a big news story breaks, people may be, you know, off doing doing something about that i um i i was once i think i was in 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 the house when something major had happened maybe maybe something to do with boris johnson maybe even his uh, resignation and very late in the day there was one solitary uh, mp who'd obviously spent a long time writing a very uh, detailed speech and they were speaking to one other person i felt very sorry for them um, uh, Les Leslie, you have a question. Sorry, I was going to request a conversation for another day um, with Victor, if he's doing stuff on the Energy Charter Treaty, because Clive Lewis has agreed to talk to me on that, um, but I'm not sure quite what to ask him for. Um, I think he'll be on side with it. Um, yes, I mean, I'm talking... I'm told that the Labour Party are going to come out in favour of the UK leaving the, the Energy Charter Treaty, but they're looking for a good opportunity to say that. And they seem to have waited weeks and weeks and still not found this opportunity, so I don't really know what they're waiting for. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the best people on this, I think, are Global Justice Now, who yeah. published uh, stuff on, on the subject. Thank uh, you. But, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk. Uh, more about that. Thank you. Um, Je Jessica, is your hand up from before? Oh, it's uh, it's a new one. Okay. Um, uh, you, you go and then Hugo. <laughs> well, I'm happy for Hugo to go first because uh, I've already been. Okay. Uh, you're muted, Hugo. Mine was just a remark, really. Um, I don't remember exactly. I remember campaigning about TTIP. I don't know if you remember TTIP. Yes, yeah, yeah. Same, that's the same sort of beast as this uh, Charter Treaty is. Um, yeah. I don't remember how that was defeated, but I remember it was defeated. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of opposition. Uh, in, it, I think especially in the USA, uh, you know, made a big difference. Mm. I mean, it's insane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the select committee process because for me, it seems to be the only serious process in, in the whole kit and caboodle where people are actually held to account and um, MPs work um, productively in a cross-party way with each other. Yeah. How is it? How is it that there can be such a different ethos in the smaller room? <laughs> um, yeah, it is peculiar. Um, it is peculiar because, you know, when they're in the chamber, they, they'll shout at each other and denounce each other. But when they are sitting in the same room, they're often much more polite and collaborative. I mean, that, that's, I think that's, you know, partly just how people are. Um, but also the, the select committees, you know, almost always produce unanimous reports. So therefore they, they, they have to go about it in a consensus way. Um, 
and I mean, I'm interested at the moment, the new energy committee, they're wanting to start off with, with some things where they have a consensus, you know, sort of guaranteed right from the beginning so that they can work together as a committee in a collaborative way. So they've, they've basically chosen, first of all, to do something about heating homes in, in the winter where they'll all be able to say, you know, something should be done. And then they're going to basically, um, you know, give the national grid a, a hard time because they're all agreed that the national grid has done a poor job on, on renewables, especially. Um, but but what that can lead to is not having some of the topics that that we might want to see um, investigated because there is this tendency to go for topics where they think there'll be some agreement, or sometimes they just say oh, we'll have one conservative topic and one Labour topic. Um, and then you don't necessarily get a more kind of radical topic uh, coming up at all. Um, but yeah, I should also say about the select committees that as well as MPs seriously working on the topics, uh, it's also an opportunity for other people to feed in. So all the inquiries uh, well, nearly all the inquiries are open to the public to send in written evidence, and then um, there will be evidence session, uh, witness sessions, at which um, people will be called to give evidence in in person, be questioned. Um, and so, I think it's important to watch the um, calls for evidence. So, the new energy committee has just produced its calls for evidence for its first four topics. Um, so that's an opportunity to feed in, although they've given the deadline of August the 25th for these things, which doesn't give people much time, especially if they want. Where, uh, where are those posted for the public? Oh, where they post If you go on the Parliament website um, and you go into committees and then you go on select committees and then you go on energy security and net zero, then you can find it there. Uh, and also, yeah, the choice of witnesses to give evidence um you know is important because uh mps will try and get their own favorite people to give evidence to back up whatever they want to hear said you know so there is a politics about who gets invited and also i think who gets invited is an indication of who's regarded as an expert or which organisations are regarded as important in the field and what is part of the debate and what is beyond the pale. Yeah. Jessica. Um, yeah, brilliant. I think it's great that you're tracking the energy bill so closely, um, Victor. Please um hands thing you know um keep prompting us um i um you seem very on it so um that's that's cool i was just um wondering about the appgs now that is a way really for a bit of sort of soft corruption in my view um because as you said um some of them will have funded for um team members in it um how do sometimes you hear about those groups like going off on trips would they is it would it be the appgs or the select committees that do that and you know um is that how they get some of the kind of um freebies um there was somebody reasonably recently perhaps you can remember who it was who was saying that when they have treats, I think that it's three grand. Before three grand, you don't have to declare it. And after three grand, you do. And he was saying, oh, and a hilarious number of things turn out to be 2,900 pounds. <laughs> um, uh, and somebody caught him uh, uh, saying, <laughs> saying that. So um, could you say a bit about APPGs and whether you think there's any mileage in us sort of digging into them because there probably are some climate T ones in there. There are yeah. there's a huge number of them, aren't there? Yes, yes. Um, so, well, foreign trips can be organised by APPGs or, or select committees. Um, 
uh, yeah, there's a vast number of APPGs, um, some of which don't really do anything. They might just have an AGM and that's all they do. They just exist on paper. Um, and others are active. Um, for example, there's um, an APPG on Green New Deal and the organization Gre um, Green, what's it called? Green New Deal Rising. Provide oh. the they provide the secretariat for that for that APPG. Um, uh, so some that is the why, because they inter they interrupt quite a lot of government <laughs> meetings. Yeah, the yes. Green New Deal rising folk. So presumably, the fact they're in Parliament helps them get a bit of intel. <laughs> Well, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know if people realise that they provide the Secretariat for Green New Deal, APPG, um, if that became, you know, more widely known, maybe people would, you know, not be so keen on it, you know, especially as they interrupted Keir Starmer making this education speech. Um, but, um, yeah, and then some, um, I mean, I've just seen, um, there's an APPG on bees and pollination. And that's basically run by Bug Life, which is an NGO. Um, some APGs are basically run by, by companies. Um, uh, and often the people who, who run the APGs can then get House of Commons passes uh, on the basis that they're working for the APPG. Although they still have to be sponsored by an MP. Uh, it can't be just the, the APPG, but... But they tend, but they can get their own people in that way. Maybe we can have one. <laughs> well, let's have your own APPG. Well, you could, um, but they do have to be all part. Well, not all party, but you always have to find a conservative who will join your APPG. So, uh, uh, but it can be some of them are, are from the Lords as as well. So. There's Lord Randall of Uxbridge is an environmentalist who has signed up to, you know, to be the conservative for some things, some good, you know, greenish APPGs. <coughs> and presumably, Victor, if Labour were to get in, you'd have to have a Labour person. Is, a, is somebody the same as the government? Oh, no, what I mean is... You just have to have a Tory in. Yeah, what I mean is that a lot of APPG, sort of progressive causes, APPGs, they they can get, uh, you know, they can get a few Labour MPs, they can get a Liberal, they can get SNP, but then they all have this problem, oh, we've got to have one Conservative, and often they, you know, flounder around for that. Um, so that's that's often the problem about setting up an APPG. Interesting. Uh, Leslie's just put in the chat. Could we try and get one on standards and honesty? <laughs> uh, Hugo, uh, you're muted again. Hugo, just wanted to ask if we can find out online uh, whether our MP is a member of any APPG. Ah, uh, um, I think you can. Yes, I think you can get. You can get a list of it online. You can get a list of the APPGs, and then I think if you click on it, you get the membership. Okay, I'm not sure about that, but I, I think you can. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, Leslie, is that hand from before, or are you, uh, have you got a question now? New question, very quick one. Um, these APPGs that have to be all parties, do you have to have a member of each party at each meeting for it to be core it, or do they just have to sign up to say, I'll be a member of this group? Yeah, they just have to sign up. And often APPGs organise meetings where, you know, the public turn up thinking that this is a meeting of MPs and maybe there are only one MP there. So, you know, I've been to meetings of APPGs where, the, the, you know, it, it's, it's kind of in that sense all audience and only one MP who's the one that's booked the room uh, will actually be there. And do they have any powers? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they can have influence. Um, yes, and especially if they, you know, especially if they really are active, um, 
yeah, then they can have influence. And you know, the the Green New Deal APPG is 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 going to sort of gear itself up to do a, a lot more yeah. in the autumn. I was I was thinking more of the Tufton Street cabal. Um, oh well, there's the whole world of think tanks. That's yeah. another that's another thing. Yes, uh, which I think have become a very important part of the British system these days. Yeah, in many ways, uh, Jessica. Yeah. Can um, the public attend, and can they attend select committees as well? The public can can attend select committees. Um, uh, generally, you can only get into the building to go to an APPG if you have a, a letter of invitation. Um, I, select, um, I mean, so, so select committees are far more available to the public than the public realizes in that you can turn up and be in the audience and also you can send in written evidence saying you know saying what you think so you know that it's a kind of underused thing I, I think yeah that's very useful to know uh have we any more questions on this topic uh i just like quickly to go back to um the the whole process of whipping uh, because it, it seems to me that if there's collective responsibility and you're whipped to vote in line with uh, with the, with you know what the what the government's position is, what is the point of having a representative? Well, the argument is that this is part of the accountability, the democratic accountability. Because if you vote for an MP because they're a member of a party, you expect them to vote with the party um, uh, and perhaps in line with the party's manifesto. Um, so the idea is that the whips are merely, um, you know, operating what the public have voted for by voting for that party. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it seems to me to be just just one strand of what seems to be a, a kind of creeping process of disenfranchisement uh, that that is going on. I mean, I think that uh, I think the speaker himself has uh, has uh, recently complained or frequently complains about the government bypassing the rest of the House of Commons totally. Uh, so. Well, that's that's often about announcements that. You know, announcements of, change, of new government policies are supposed to be made in the House of Commons, and increasingly governments have been doing them at press conferences outside and photo ops and so on. And the speaker doesn't like it. Jessica. Um, can you go through, I mean, I think it's pretty clear it's not working, but can you go through um, how MPs are supposed to be honest, and why, and you know what what they can say about each other when they're dishonest, and um, what um, well, obviously we've just seen with Boris uh, what you can do about it if they're uh, in extremists. But um, would you mind uh, just? I, I believe it's based on the days when people thought that their life with their reputation, if they lost their reputation, it didn't, you know, they were worthless citizens. <laughs> um, mm, uh, yeah, no, this is a big topic. Um, I mean, the thing is that uh, MPs make distinctions that I think most people don't make. So they're prepared to mislead or evade or change the subject or uh, be very selective about use of statistics and so on and none of those things are, the, are lying but I think for the public they often just think that's dishonesty so things are only really regarded as dishonest if they really are directly untruthful um, so it's very sort of strict uh, interpretation of that, I think. Um, I mean, strict, you know, strict <laughs> to the advantage of MPs. And there's also the, the statistics authority. Um, okay. 
right to people um, to tell them that they they've misrepresented the, the statistics and, and that that can count for something as well. Um, well, um, that's all been absolutely fascinating, Victor. Thank you so much for the time uh, that you've given us, and uh, we shall we shall talk again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.